I'm I'm here a total of three and a half weeks. Okay. This okay. is a little shorter run because we have a group from the Terrible coming. Oh, in and fact, that's what you're okay. I just found out last week we're on the same flight going from Miami to Lima. Are you really? Yeah. So I hit the ground running. That wow. So yeah, you don't you don't have like a no a change gear no, time. No, no. <laughs> Not only that. You're already on the clock. But for the past year, I've had Father Amir. He's a priest from India. Okay. He's been with me. He's working on his Spanish. He had a year off to get his visa. Or, you know, after five years, they have to go back to India, spend a year, get their visa, come back. Well, he said, instead of going back to India, send me to South America. So he oh. he said, send me to uh, Castle Guard to work on Spanish. So he's been a helper to me for the past year. He leaves the day I come back. Oh, oh no. So I get back um, Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. So I'll get back about 1 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Oh, boy. We'll have mass right away in the morning. And then at night at 5 o'clock, we'll have a big dinner with him and then send him off. And then send him off. And the group is going to be there, too. And they'll be, so they'll be there so, all of that. Um, it'll be a big day. Wow. And how, how big is the group from the turbo that's going? I think it's about eight. Eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is great. Is this part of the campus ministry that's going, or is yes. this part of a class? Emilio. Of, Emilio, yeah. Is he going as well? He's going as oh, well. Oh, he's a good guy. It'll he be a nice good. group. Yeah, that is awesome. He'll be there, I'm not sure how many days, but uh, it, I would say a good eight days. That's good. That's good. And how are the kids doing there at the orphanage? I'll find out when I get there. Oh, <laughs> how were they before you left? <laughs> They're kids. <laughs> They're kids. So they um, are kids. There's always a couple episodes. Yeah. I've been gone three and a half weeks. And so do you think kids can go without incident for three and a oh, half weeks? I can't. I don't no. think for three and a half minutes. No. <laughs> so, so, so they're my kids. But yeah. I, I've got a good team of people and a psychologist and program director. And they stay on top of the stuff, you know, the kids and working with them. But um, I'm more the pastoral presence. Yeah. And so when I come back, then the kids want to sit down and talk and go to confession. And so they, they seek you out to go to confession and they seek you out. I, I have a holy hour every day. That's great. And is it, We've been attended? It's the morning one, not so much because mm -hmm. I have um, that twice a week to catch the kids that are free in the morning. That's a smaller group. In the afternoon, sometimes we'll get up to 30 of them at wow. a time. So uh, we, we do music. That's great. And so when we start a holy hour, uh, we'll have exposition. We'll do the Solitaris Ostia. And then uh, I'll do a song on the guitar. And the kids, kids will join in with me on that song. And then if there's uh, some kids that want to go to confession, then I'll put the guitar down. Wow. And the kids will take over. After every two songs, they pray a decade of the rosary. And on Fridays, they do the chaplet. On Saturdays, they do the rosary, the whole rosary. And typically, they'll do two songs, decade of the rosary. I might do the reading of the day, repeat it, give a little fervorino. Sure. And then uh, two songs, a decade of the rosary. We'll do that for the hour. We started doing... We only had a holy hour a week for okay. um, before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, I, I was real concerned about the virus. Yeah. So I said, we are going to have two holy hours a day. Half the group one hour, half the group the other. Okay. <laughs> and mass every day. And we did that for two and a half years. Wow. That's a long time. That's a long time. And what, wow. then I had to cut back to one hour. And I will, I'll tell the kids, now that we're into the regular school year, I would say, if you can make it like three times a week, four times a week, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. I have it every day. And then those who want to do a little more, they're there. Plus, because I'm there every day, the kids can come to confession. 
Oh. On Monday, it's my day off. So I tell the kids, I'm not doing an official holy hour, but I will be in chapel at 3 o'clock if anybody wants to confess. Oh, that's great. So there's, there's usually quite a few confessions that we get. Wow. And what, is, what, is the, what are the ages of the kids that are there? To, like, the six, range? six to 18. Six to 18. Mm -hmm. That's quite a range. When they turn 18 that, and they don't have a place to go, then they move to the to volunteer house. Okay. And we only have a few of those. Otherwise, when they graduate, we try to get them back into their homes. Okay. Because they've got to begin to reestablish those relationships with their families. Yeah. And even during their time at CASA, during the pandemic, they could hardly go home. Oh. That first year, they went nine months without going home. Wow. And did, did their families come see them there? They or could only just... talk to them from the door. Oh, boy. It was bad. Oh, but boy. Peru was super strict. Yeah. And... Um, and per capita, Peru is one of the worst countries in the world mm. for deaths. And so, uh, it, very strict rules. They could not touch each other. Oh, boy. So finally, after nine months, we said, these kids are going to be a basket case if we don't let them go. So we sent them home. But then it was risky because they're going into poor parts of town. Mm -hmm. And are they going to bring the virus back? Oh. And we have been praying all year for nine months. Yeah. And it ended up, um, when the kids came back, I was the only one with COVID. Really? Yeah. Because oh. when they went, I went to I went back to lacrosse. Oh. And I was fine. I, I uh, checked out COVID free. Yeah. Got on my airline, heading back, got to Casa. But on the way back, I started catching on the sore throat, oh, and yeah. miserable body ache. Those signs. And the next morning, I thought, well, I'll shake it and didn't shake it. Well, I woke up, I thought, I am not good. Yeah. So I called uh, Sister Carla from our diocese. She's a nurse. And she uh, got me a doctor to come out and visit because I could not even leave campus. Because according to the quarantine rule mm -hmm. in Peru, I cannot leave the house. If they call me and I'm not there, it's a huge fine. Wow. So I could not even go to the hospital to get checked. Oh. So. And you just left. So I had a doctor come and he checked me and said, you got COVID. So I, uh, I wrote home. I said, how's mom? She's got a bad cold. Oh, no. You get it checked. Yeah. Yes. She had COVID. And she had it. Oh, yeah. no. But how did she get it? I have no idea. Yeah. We have no idea. Yeah. But I had a quarantine for the uh, airport anyway. So I quarantined for 16 days. Two more than I had to. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and no kid had COVID. Wow. They, there were a couple of kids who had colds. We told them stay at home yeah. for another week or so. They came back. Nobody brought back COVID. That's a miracle. Yeah, I, that's yeah, why there's, there's no say, reason that that should have happened. Have like, you seen little miracles? Yeah, that's one of them. That's one of them. The fact that we were praying hard because mm -hmm. I have people who um, asthmatic, adults yeah. who are diabetic, hypertension. You know, there's a number of conditions that were all not good for COVID. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and it ended up that they did not get it. I had one woman who was pregnant and we had to send her to the hospital to have her baby. And the only hospital they could send her to is socialized medicine. That's really oh. a good deal. Oh, good deal. Wow. No, it's not. I was going to say, <laughs> I was like, oh boy. <laughs> she had to go to that hospital. Oh. It was the COVID hospital. And um, I anointed her. Gave her the prayer card of Father Jose Balieski. Mm -hmm. We prayed every day for her. She had her baby. A couple of days later, came home. No COVID. And neither one? Neither one. What? Nor her <laughs> husband who went with her. And wow. um, so we went through that whole year yeah. of 2021. We get to Christmas of 21. Now, during uh, 
2021, we let the kids go home after six months. And then at Christmas, it was three months after their last visit. And when the kids all left, there were about 10 kids that could not leave. Mm. Those kids all got COVID. Really? Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. At Casa. Oh. Didn't even leave the place. Oh. But that just tells me that this whole COVID thing, it, that could have hit us at any second yeah. of the time. Yeah. Because we closed the whole place up. But somebody had to leave almost every day to get yeah. groceries. Yeah. And there was, we, we had only particular people set to go out and real strict rules and mm -hmm. they'd have to come back, change their clothes, a all, all bunch of stuff. All that, yeah. But, um, but we were COVID free basically at our house for almost, it was three months short of two years. That's amazing. Which I'm, I'm just amazed. Yeah. And then after that, um, we really didn't, we, I think we had a couple of people get it in the house. But by that time, it was the fourth wave. Yeah. And you really just bad. isolate a little bit, five days, six yeah. days. <clears throat> Canceled all the groups. Nobody came down for, well, it was about, it was a year. Oh. And and the kids love that when they come down, don't oh, they? Oh, yes. Yeah. And then we experimented. Noelle came down. She's mm -hmm. the lady that helps yeah. me. She came down with a group of about five. They had to quarantine for like, I don't know, seven days. And then they had to wear masks the rest of the time. It was, it was horrible, but they wanted to be there. And yeah. so they did it. And then we had another group come down. We continued to back down on, the, on the, all those precautions, little by little. But the groups are back now, everything's normal. That's good. Yeah. That's how was the who do you remember the first group that came after all of that? Which one it was? I was thinking even more of like how the kids reacted when that first group came back. Pacelli came. They did. Well, first of all it would be Noel. Okay. And then she brought a few of of people who have had some experience. Then there was a group from Assumption okay. came. And um and they, none of our kids got COVID, but two of the teachers got COVID. Really? Yeah. It's like you have this armor yeah. <laughs> over there. Two of, the, two of the teachers from Assumption got COVID. Oh. And I think maybe one student, we isolated them, but none of that transferred into our house. And there's just no... I don't, I don't Rhyme understand. or reason, yeah. like, I guess, logically, of what, except for a miracle. And yeah. so anyway, that the whole COVID thing passed, but uh, it was it, it was very very strict. When COVID started, the cops were in the streets, the National Guard. Oh. And it was martial law. Oh. All night, that's scary. from six p.m. to six a.m., nobody could be in the streets. And there were a couple times we had to take people to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Then you have to put out a white handkerchief. They're going to stop you. And then you got to be able to tell them it's an emergency. But then other than that, I could not celebrate mass anywhere. It was prohibited for mm -hmm. to have any masses where um, you're traveling. But you could bring food to people. You could. Yeah. So if I... I wasn't able to do much for public mass, but if I had to go to another orphanage, I just put some food in mm, the car. Got it, got and it. And then with that, but, um, but we had mass at our house every single day wow. during COVID. Wow. And that's for a hundred people. A hundred oh, people. Man, man. <laughs> we moved to our, our, our dining room because we have more room for social distancing. Yeah. But still, every single day, the whole community was together. That's great. And then in the afternoon, the, uh, the well, the kids would study all day, virtual learning. Mm -hmm. We had to come up with extra phones and because uh, we're not set up for virtual learning. But we had to get something uh, hacked together 
and our Wi-Fi would would uh, fail almost oh, every day. Yeah. And uh, but the kids would study during the day, and then about four o'clock, they would go outside and play football, oh, soccer. Yeah. And so we had a pretty normal life compared to most people. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of the other kids in other areas, they were with masks mm -hmm. all the time, and could they could only leave their house for a short walk yeah. with a mask. I mean, it was terrible. It sounds like you're able to stay with a routine, whereas yeah. everyone else routine got kind of blown up. <laughs> we even had five that first year. We had five quinceañeras. Wow. And these girls said, please, can't you do something for us? Yeah. So it was prohibited to have social gatherings. And uh, I, I mean, they don't take into account that we're an orphanage. Right. Right. And, the, right. and the kids who sleep together in a dorm. Yeah. You know, we can't we can't isolate ourselves. Yeah. So we had the we had the quinceañeras, but we would black out the windows, <laughs> put the volume on low, <laughs> and then dance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we did something. So it was That's it was, great. That's the creativity yeah. of ministry. Yeah. So oh. it was it was an interesting time. The other thing we did is during the holy hours, this goes back to Father Jose's time, he would have the little kids come into holy hours and draw pictures. Okay. And so I have a stack now of drawings about, about this high. Wow. And some of them are really, really good. So what these kids would do is they would go into the Action Bible. Mm -hmm. You've heard of that? Yeah, yeah. They would go into the Action Bible, use that as their as their example, and they would draw these pictures. Oh, and uh, I'm, I'll never throw those away. No, no. That's, Could you make that into a book or something or kind of a... Easily. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I'm just holding on to those. I've got a lot of them in pictures, uh, in slides. But um, Oh, nice. But it, I, I consider that a treasure from the oh. pandemic days. Yeah. That is amazing. Well, and you mentioned... Um, you mentioned this being one of the miracles you've seen there. What What's another miracle you've seen happen happen over there? Or you, maybe you've seen a ton. Our baker, I would say one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. Our baker, his wife, had an aneurysm, and oh. they didn't know about it. Oh. And they live on a house that has like a platform. Then you climb a ladder to another level and another ladder to another level. Okay. And the, you're talking about eight feet. And she was carrying a tank of gas for the, uh, for the stove from the top down. And she fell from the ladder, hit the cement, and uh, somehow was able to get up. Then she what? went to the next level, fell off that ladder, hit the cement, now her, her uh, she was she was out cold and her husband was sleeping because he's a baker during the night mm. little daughter comes out and says daddy daddy mom won't wake up oh. and he went out and found her practically dead they took her to the hospital uh, again socialized medicine mm. really cool <laughs> <laughs> she was in a hospital in the hallway for various days she's got brain bleed and if they don't get her into surgery within six days, she's dead, That's she's it. gonna die because they won't do surgery after six days. And so several days pass and they say, it's, we, don't, we, we can't do it. All they give her is aspirin. So they moved her to another hospital. And then um, she was there for several days. Mm -hmm. And then the hospital had a crisis where they had a malfunction in the microscope that is used for that surgery. And they said, for now, there will be no further surgeries. The husband came to me on Friday night crying. Yeah. And he said, I now know that my wife will die. Oh. And um, I called up my administrator. This was on a holiday weekend, like the 4th of July, but mm -hmm. it's the end of July. But it's their, their Independence Weekend. Nobody's working. 
and I asked him if he could do some, if he could find out what a surgery would cost. Mm -hmm. And he came back early from his vacation on Saturday, spent about 13 hours going from place to place, found two surgeons who would do the surgery. We had to pay them on the spot. Yeah. And we're in this, we're in the last day. And, but we needed an operating room. He looked everywhere and he finally found another hospital that had an operating room. We transferred her at 4 p.m. on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And surgery began at 8. And the, the last day was Sunday. Oh my gosh. And so it lasted about five, six hours. She survived. Really? Yeah. I call that an administrative miracle. <laughs> yeah. There's no way in Peru that that could have been done. Wow. And and it was really slim that she could survive, and she did. Oh, that was goodness. one. Then, um, we've had kids. There was uh, there was a kid who fell on the hill, and. Uh, he piled into a bunch of rocks, face down, Ooh. jagged rocks. <clears throat> that day before we went out on that walk, I was praying in chapel, and uh, and I, I just something felt weird, and I did some extra prayers, and and every time we go for a walk, we go up the hill to the grave of Father Joe Balieski, mm -hmm. and we pray asking his intercession. And that day when that guy fell, it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. Mm. And I, I thought he was going to have tons of, of damage. Yeah. And teeth, nose, eye. Oh. And I, I tap him. I say, Miguel, Miguel, are you awake? Yeah. Okay, move, move your fingers. Move your hands. Move your arms. Move your toes. Move your feet. The pieces are working. Yeah. I turned him over. He was cut up. And um, and but I couldn't clean him up enough with my handkerchief mm -hmm. to see how much damage. I walked with him, and the kids were with me. Walked with him back a kilometer uh -huh. back to the house. Put him under a bright light. Washed him up. A nurse was there. No stitches. No stitches? No. What? No chip tooth. Nothing. Really? Nothing. <laughs> so, um, that's that's one. Wow. I. That that's amazing. But I, we we've had a couple of those kinds of things. Yeah. And, but the the COVID. The. Um, uh, you know, so just some of the, some of those accidents that happened where yeah. it never got serious. Yeah, but and they have, should have. I mean, by all accounts, they have to be. <laughs> yeah, have to be. Yeah. That, and uh, so. Wow. And how long have you been there? Ten years. Ten years. Okay. Ten years and six months. Ten. But the first six months were uh, in Bolivia. Okay. Okay. And is this, is this, and maybe, maybe it's different. I don't know. But is this like where you feel like this is where I am meant to be? Like, this is what, this is that. Because when we, I mean, we talk about, like, when we talk with young people too, like about vocation, you know, and, and just, you know, like, like with marriage, it's like, yeah, I'm called to be married, but, but who are you called to be married to? How is that marriage going to be a ministry to people? Or, or those who are called to the priesthood. Okay, great. You, you were ordained a priest. Now, now in what capacity will you serve as a priest? You know, and, those kinds of so I know you've served as you know parish priest and the, the vocations director for the diocese as well and and now and now and among other things but every job that I did prepared me for this mm. and uh, and so uh, Spanish came to me in high school I didn't go to Spanish really? we had a um, our Spanish teacher called up one day saying. I have an exchange student coming from Peru who needs a place and the family just canceled. Would you take him in? Oh. And mom said, no, we have nine kids. <laughs> and it was 
couple of weeks before Christmas. Yeah. And the guy's coming the day after Christmas. No. But that night, Mom mentioned it to us. And I don't know why we just felt something about that. And the kids, we all said, please, let's have them. Yeah. And we talked her into it. And that changed our whole life. Mm -hmm. Our whole family is different now. Because, because of that kid? He was so yeah. good. I'm good friends with him. Are and you still? Oh, well, yeah, I just saw him about Did you really? a couple months ago. Wow. He came by Casa Ogar. He's from out of Kipapu. Okay. And um, Ignacio Bayonanda. And I didn't like Spanish. I was in Spanish one in my junior year. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it. And then he came, and within a month, I liked Spanish. Wow. And then the teacher said, we should really have somebody go from here to South America. Oh. I raised my hand. Yeah. She said, no, you're in Spanish one. This is for Spanish three or four. So she kept asking. Nobody wanted it. I kept raising my hand. Yeah. I don't know why I wanted it. Yeah. And uh, finally she gave it to me. Out of default, there was nobody else. Oh. And I went to Ecuador. It was very difficult to go there with only one stinking year of Spanish. Mm, I bet. And, but I came back from that experience in, for my second semester senior year and jumped into Spanish four. Second semester. Graduated. Went to college. What do you like? I don't know. Spanish. Can we make a Spanish major? So I was a Spanish major in college. And, uh, and then we traveled again. And so Spanish has been a part of my life forever. And when I got ordained, I, I've always had a desire for the missions. Yeah. I did volunteer work for Glen Mary Missions, mm -hmm. uh, visited Marino Mission mm -hmm. in South America, a couple of them, when I was traveling. And, uh, but I never wanted to be a diocesan. Really? It's boring. It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got the call to go to <coughs> Casa Hogar, it was like all the light bulbs went on, went on your path, like, oh, that, like you said, this led me to this, to this, to this. Well, first of all, I thought it would be very, <coughs> very boring to be a diocesan. I never wanted it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, you know, I visited the Mary Knoll, but I didn't fall in love with it. I visited Glen Mary, spent a lot of time with them, but I did not fall in love. It's like when you date a girl and you say, well, she really needs a date. Yep. But I, I have to be in love with her. Yep. And I wasn't in love. And so I thought, I, I'm not falling in love with anybody. <coughs> Excuse me. But I just felt like I got to do something with my life. And the only door open at that time to try the seminary, and Father Burke, now Cardinal Burke, was yeah. key in saying, try it out. And uh, the only door open was diocesan. So. You never know with these things. <laughs> so I went to the seminary and little by little, it was not love at first sight, mm -hmm. but little by little, I just felt at peace that this is what I'm meant to do. So diocesan ministry is what I'm meant to do. Mm -hmm. And then in, uh, in the mid nineties, Father Joe Valieski, because I had already known him. I've known him for 50 years. Yeah. And um, he said, I would like to, I would like to train missionaries. I would like to have people come down to South America, learn a mission spirituality. And so it's like missionary disciples. Yeah. And, but he used the word reverse mission. Say so we're diocesan mission. We should be, we should be preparing people to be missionaries. Mm -hmm. And so, um, he said, I'd like to get some priests to bring people down. So there were a number of us, and we sent a group down in 96. Then in okay. 98, 2001. I went 2004, and then after that, other priests wanted to take over, and I we passed it on. Then we started having multiple trips wow. after that. And uh, so I've always wanted to go to the missions, but the door was closed. And then... But actually in 97, Bob Flock wanted, asked me if I would take over uh, Bolivia. And uh, I went to Father Burke, Bishop Burke, yeah. and he finally let me do it. But I went down there, when I got down there with Bishop Burke to talk my new assignment, this was in 97, mm -hmm. he changed his mind. 
Oh. So I got aborted. Oh. So I, got, I, I didn't get it. But I felt a great peace with that. Yeah. And I told Bishop Burke afterwards, I said, I thought I would have a depression because I, it was on my mind. For, yeah. For nine months, yeah. I never got out of my head that I would be going there. But I said, what I've learned from this is that God called me to have a mission spirituality. Oh. And so I now know what the rest of my life's spirituality is. I don't have to be a missionary in a foreign country. I can do that here. Yeah. So at that point, I said, I am a missionary in the Diocese of La Crosse. That's my identity. And wow. I was doing youth retreats and work yep. with Hmong, work with Hispanic, uh, teaching high school, working all over the diocese, doing the heartstrings music ministry, yep. and, uh, and then taking trips to South America, uh, working with kids who want to become missionaries. Yeah. And then in the year 2012, Bob Flock calls me up. Monsignor, now Bishop Flack, he says, I'm going on a, on a uh, sabbatical. Would you take it over for six, five months? I said, I'd love to. Mm -hmm. So about the time that I say yes to that, Father Sebastian calls me up. So I said, I got a, a difficulty with, with visa. I've got to become a citizen of the U.S. Somebody's got to take over for five years. Oh. Well, I had told Bishop Burke, I said, I received a call. I said, yes. And God shut the door. I said, I will never, ever ask to go to South America. If God wants it, he has to open the door. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'll wait for the bishop to call me. The bishop calls me up. Bishop Callahan says, I need somebody to go to South America. Would you go? I said, well, I'm already booked for Bolivia. He said, go there for five months, and then I'd have you go to uh, Peru. Oh, and wow. And God opened the and door. there was. So people said, do you have any doubts about it? I mean, I was, I was 57 years old. Yeah. At 57, my whole life is in the U.S. All my yeah. friends, my family, everything. Everything. And to say goodbye to that and go to a foreign land, yeah. uh, it's a little tough. Yeah. But I said, there was something happened to me in my second grade. Somebody asked me in second grade, what are you going to be when you grow up? A missionary. What? I said, I don't know what that means. Right. But I said it. Yeah. And I, I said, I have to say yes, because I want to find out what was that spark in second grade. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel that this is who I am, what I am, what I am to do. Wow. And I'll... I'll do it until my health can't do it. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and but we're you always have to be looking at replacements who can take it over. Yeah. But I know that Father Sebastian in my life are always going to be, you know, they're. You're always crossing the path. Or always yeah, there's something real special yeah. there. Yeah. And I had Father Kyle Leyland come down for uh -huh. a year. He's got it. He's he got it. Oh, good. Oh, my gosh. Good. And, um, but, so I put it in God's hands. Yeah. And I say, Lord, if you have, if you have people that are to take this over, this is your job, not my job. Yeah. But I, I do tell the bishop, send me priests. Oh, yeah. Because I can't imagine a better place to learn Spanish. And send me yeah. seminarians. I can't imagine a better place to learn a mission spirituality oh. and, and missionary discipleship. But I'm also looking for lay people. I don't know who's listening to this, Yeah. but a lay person, man or woman, somewhere in their 20s, who could take three to six months to a year off and okay. come down. They have to know some Spanish. They don't have to be virtuosos. Yeah. But they have to have some Spanish. Come down and um, share their skills and do, work the volunteer program. Yeah. Be the li liaison between the well in the U.S. and the people. I need help translating letters, trans, um, working with the visitors that come because the visitors often don't speak uh -huh. Spanish. 
my life is so much in the pastoral side yeah. that I can't give everything to the groups when they come down. Yeah. And so I, I need these volunteers. It's an important role. Oh, sure. Plus, yeah. simply to be able to teach the kids English and practice English with them, help yeah. them with their English homework and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. It, it changes your life. Yeah. One thing is to go to, uh, I'm going to do a school trip to Mexico or to Spain. I, I, I've done that. I like it. Mm -hmm. But you get to see museums and churches. Yeah. Another thing is to be able to enter into the very lives of the people. Yes. Yes. And, um, and especially with volunteers, as they get to know the kids. I've heard this where a number of times where they'll say, I know that there's nothing that I can say that can really help this child, but I'm listening to them and I want to suffer with them. Yeah. You know, I'm listening. Yeah. I'm walking with them. Yeah. And uh, when they when they are doing that, then I, I know they're getting in touch with that mission spirituality. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and well, when we do mission trips, and I know we'd have kids that you know you're at someone's house, and then the the homeowner would be there, and the kid would end up talking to the homeowner, and then sometimes the kids would come up to me like, "I am so sorry, I got to talking, I'm not working," you know. I said, "No, no, no." That's the mission. You're doing the work. The work is to connect with the people. The the physical labor will get done. We'll yeah. get it done. But it's the people. <laughs> Father Jose said the same thing. He'd say, you're not here to save the poor Peruvian. He can paint the garage. He can mm -hmm. he can do these things. But all your work is a is the vehicle of encounter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, same thing. Well, in that mission spirituality, too, I mean, it's... I mean, I, I look back in my own life and, and working in ministry and thinking, you know, am I in the right spot? Am I, you know, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this what I'm called to do? But having a mission spirituality would change that mindset completely because it'd be like, I'm where God has put me, and I'm I'm a missionary in this in this land of ministry. It puts you out of yourself. Yeah, it's not about me. It's about where He wants me, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's not. With the kids, we call that the dangerous question. Mm. And I ask the kids, are you asking the dangerous question? Many of them will say, mm, I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, right. But I'm not asking. I don't want to ask it. Nope. Because nope. I'm afraid he'll ask too much. Yeah. But just the fact that we can introduce this idea. Yeah. And the dangerous yeah. question, I'll ask the kids, what's a dangerous question? Lord, what do you want of me? Yeah. How do you want me to serve? And that's typically countercultural, at least here in America, with, with a lot of our young people, because it's not, what do you want of me? It's what can you do for me? And then, you know, it's kind of how relationships tend to be in, in our culture today, for whatever reason. But is that, do you find that with the Peruvian kids? Oh, yeah, as we're well? fight, what fighting that too. Me? Because people want to get a little bit of an education. They want a job that will pay enough to pay the bills. They want a girlfriend, yeah. and uh, you know, it's like you say, you ever think about being a priest? Mm. No, Father, I want to get married. So did I. <laughs> 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 it's, it's not that we didn't want to get married. Yeah. I, I, you go through a discernment process, but yeah. I think uh, any, any guy who wants to be a father I, I don't want a bachelor to be a priest. Yeah. A priest has to be a father. Yeah. 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 And speaking of fatherhood, I just feel being at Casa gives us an experience of father that's second to none. Oh, I can only second imagine. Second to none. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, like even in the confessional, a kid will say, no, oh, this is going bad and that's going bad. And I say, who loves you? Yeah. And they'll say, well, I know my maestro, my teacher loves me. I know you love me, Father. Mm -hmm. And just to have a relationship where they feel uh, valued. Yes. Where they feel fathered. Yeah. Because so many of these kids don't have a, a father figure in their life. Yeah. And so I, I think um, it, even to, to be able to teach guys who come down or even priests who come down. Mm -hmm. You want to experience a fatherhood, you come down here and you work with these kids. Yeah. Because 
you can play with them, you can work with them, you can, uh, you're preaching, you're teaching. See, I, I don't have these kids in my life just a few hours a week. Yeah. It's 24 seven. Yeah. And I'm at their birthday parties and, yeah. and 6.15 in the morning for mass. And, yeah. and if there's a crisis, I'm in their house. Yeah. And, uh, and the whole confession thing, you know, the kids, the kids come in and I, I get to know them psychologically from working with a psychologist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as children and families working with their maestros academically seeing how they're performing at school and then spiritually in the pastoral relationship yeah so yeah and do they do they do you sense that they feel a strong connection with Father Joe Walieski as well? Do they do they get how special he is and was? And nobody knows knew him of the kids, mm -hmm. and a couple of the teachers do. But I met Father Jose yeah. way back in 1975, shortly after he started the mission in Peru. Mm -hmm. I was a backpacker, and. And somebody had told me about this priest from the Diocese of La Crosse. And I went to visit him for what was going to be just a couple days. I stayed with him for a month. Oh. So this is almost 50 years ago. Yeah. And so I was in the mission with him. And then from the mission trips, I saw him all the time. And so I tell the stories of yeah. Father Jose. And so the kids are, they're learning those stories. Yeah. And then we pray the prayer to Father Jose for intercession. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just like when we go for walks, and we visit the grave, the grave a lot. Yeah. 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 Do, I wonder, I was talking with someone about this the other day, that as far as like sainthood, since he's, he's up for uh, canonization. canonization and, I, I told someone the other day, I feel like in a lot of people's minds that I've talked with, that they feel like saint, sainthood, the opportunity to become a saint, the opportunity for canonization, is a, is a past tense thing. It's, you know, that's all history stuff. Like, we're not doing that as much now. Of course, we, we saw with uh, Father, uh, not Father, with uh, Blessed Carlos Acuda, the Facuda, mm -hmm. and, um, and then Father Joe Walieski, you know, that that's happening, but I feel like I feel like in, in people's minds, sainthood isn't something that's attainable. Well, it's complicated. It's yeah. a long process. I had to do a bunch of interviews. They had to do interviews up here. Yeah. And then it's, it becomes a, a, a they're working on his biography. They did the biography. <clears throat> At this point, we're waiting for the miracles. Yeah. And I yeah. say, well, that's out of my hands. Yep. Lord, if you want the miracles, but I've seen, I, I could count off 10 miracles, mm -hmm. but uh, they don't count for Rome. Because okay. Rome has to have everything documented yeah. totally. Yeah. And uh, I don't mind that either. Yeah. Because I say, well, if that didn't count, give me another one. Give me another one, right, right. right. Until they count. We can, yeah. So it's if, like we if can God get. wants it to be, it'll happen. Yeah. Even if it doesn't happen, I'm happy that we're doing it. Yes. Because it it shows a holy priesthood yeah and uh, th there are there are a lot of people come up and visit the grave yeah we have we have uh, some of these elderly women from the soup kitchens from Via Salvador the slum where he used to have a parish mm -hmm. they'll come up and visit we have ex kids come up I had an interesting experience about six months ago this guy goes up, visits the grave, comes back down, and uh, and I went to greet him. I said, what's your name? He's about 38 years old. Moises. Moises. <laughs> Are you from Huancayo? He said, yeah. I said, I remember you. Wow. I said, I remember you from about 1998. <laughs> I was 96 or 98. I'm with Father Jose in the entranceway of the casa. And Father Jose is beside me and he says, let me tell you a story about this little kid, Moises. Oh, wow. 
he was hugging my leg, this little kid. Yeah. And uh, and so I tell Moises this story. He didn't remember it, but it, that uh, of hugging me. And I said, and so Father Jose said to me, this little kid, during the time of the the uh, Sendero Luminoso, the terrorist. The terrorist came to his house and uh, killed his parents with, with machetes. Oh my gosh. And the children witnessed this. And uh, shortly after that, they, the, some of the relatives sent these kids to Lima. And they got with the police. And the police knew, the, the police knew of Father Jose and brought him brought the kids over and that's how he got involved with Casa Bar. Wow. So I, so he thought that was pretty cool that I could remember him from yeah. so many years ago. Yeah. And then, because I asked him, I said, were your parents killed by the terror? Yeah. Oh. And then he told the whole story again. Yeah. Oh boy. And uh, I said, what are you doing now? He said, I'm a nurse. Wow. And so how has Casa affected you? He said, I would never be where I am yeah. were it not for Casa. Yeah. And I've heard that many times Yeah. where I'll ask a kid, because, you know, we're not a perfect house. We've got all the problems of a family. Oh, sure. If yeah. I ask your, your teenage son, yeah, how do you like living in the Rogers house? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me leave. But dad's a dork. <laughs> right. Yeah. They would definitely say that for sure. <laughs> and, and so we have, we have all the challenges of family life. Yeah. But... It's often even after the kids leave and they come back and they say, you know, I didn't know what I had. Yeah. You know, you guys, you guys really helped me. I would never be who I am, where I am, had I not been at Casa. Yeah. And so I know that we're doing something important. Are we changing the world? No. Uh, but I'm changing one little part of the world. Sure. And, you know, our work, we work with the kids. We're working with their families. The kids leave us, and we still work with them. Yeah. You know, we're trying to get technical degrees for a lot of them. And um, a lot of them will call up and say, can I just come back and talk? That's great. And uh, especially, you know, what I find with kids is you work with them, and they we have to walk with them through all the stupid stages yeah, of, yeah. <clears throat> of adolescence because they're going to make mistakes. Right. And as they make the mistakes and we can love them through those stages, then they leave us. And, and even when they leave us, they're going to make some whoppers. Sure, yeah. But then when they finally feel like, I've got to, I've got to do something, yeah, they'll come back. And I've had it many times where They'll come back and say, you know, I I need something deeper in my life. And I knew that we had it, I lost it, how can I get it back? Mm -hmm. So I I have talking with someone, someone who's talking about going to confession, there was a, a sin they were battling and they would go to confession and then they'd go back to life and then they'd recommit the sin, then they go back to confession. And then try and get it figured out, and then go back to life, and then recommit. So it was a cycle over and over mm -hmm. and over again. And the person kept saying, "You know, I kept, I kept relapsing." And I told, I said, I said, you know, the, to me, the beauty of your story is is the fight that you have in, in you that you kept coming back to confession. That a lot of people and would, I went to confession and oh, I fell back into sin. Well, that didn't work. You know, off I go, figure it out myself. But I said, you fought to stay in it. You fought to go back to confession. You knew where to keep coming back to and coming back to. And then, and then eventually he was able to beat the sin and, you know, prayed through it and confessed and everything and, and was, was through it. Um, but I see, you know, seeing that people, I think people feel guilty for falling away or feel guilty for not sticking with it. But I, I, I find a beauty that- We use a phrase back. with the kids. Everybody's going to fall. Yeah. But there's a difference between falling upwards and falling downwards. Mm. And there, because if you have no one to, to challenge you to, or to walk with you, then you fall 
then you fall again. Yeah. You fall again. That's falling downwards. Yeah. There's other people who fall and they say, can you help me? And you lift them up, they fall again. Yeah. You work with them, accompany them. Yeah. And they keep going. Yeah. But now, instead of falling downwards, they're falling upwards. Yeah. yeah. We use that phrase a lot with the kids. And so I say, look, you're going to fall. One girl told me, she said, Father, I'm 14. How, why is it so hard for me to practice chastity at 14? I could do it easier when I was 10. Mm. I said, yeah. I said, you know, when you're 10, it's like a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Put your feet on the pedals and it's pretty easy to steer and, and just, yeah. just go where you want. Yep, yep. But you're not going to stay with a bicycle all your life. Someday right. you're going to move to a car. But the car's a lot more complicated. You gotta know where the shifter is. You gotta yeah. know how to change the gears. You gotta know the RPMs. You gotta see the mirrors. You gotta accept the responsibility. You gotta go through training. You gotta do a whole bunch of stuff because you have to integrate at all these levels, yeah. all these concepts and movements. Yes, yes. And I said, when you were 10, you had a body of a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And now that you're 14, you're learning to have a body of a car. Mm. And now you have to integrate all these systems. Yeah. And yeah. uh, and we got to help the kids to be able to drive this car, yeah. which is their life, which involves who I am intellectually, emotionally, yeah. physically, socially, mm -hmm. and spiritually. Yeah. So. And then you've got the world telling them, "This is how you do it. Do it this way. This will make you do happy. Do whatever you want. Yeah, whatever you want. It's all okay with us. And so yeah." yeah. And then we get the bad rap, the church does, when we're like, oh, there's, there's a better way. <laughs> but the kids, sooner or later, <clears throat> they get kicked around, they hit the ground, um, they get somebody pregnant, or they have an abortion, mm -hmm. or, they, or they test the drugs, they're getting drunk, but they're feeling empty. And some of them don't come back, and yeah. that's a tragedy. But yeah. many of them come back and say, you know, I yeah. thought I could take the shortcut. Yeah. It's not working. It's not working. Yeah. I, I want to go to confession. I need God's help. I want to change my life. Can you help me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and their stories, for better or for worse, are an example that you, Castle Hogar, the staff, are all part of that story that when they go out into the community, it's like, here's here's something special here, and I can attest to this. Or like the one that you talked to that uh, Moises, yes. that's a nurse now, um, the lives that he's affected, I can only imagine mm -hmm. because of what he received at Castle Hogar and through the people there, um, that, that ripple effect, that it just doesn't end with him. It's all these people that he comes into contact with. But you know, the root of all of this, the crisis, the crisis mm. is marriage and yeah. family. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you talk about the crisis of priesthood, yeah. The crisis of religious vocations, yeah. Yeah. But all vocations come from the family. I was with my brother last night in, down in Rockford, Illinois, mm. for supper. And, um, and my brother, he, he, we were talking about Castle Gar with some people that know about it. And my brother says, you know, the reason I am successful or the reason I am who I am is because I had good parents. Mm -hmm. And if we can just teach kids how to be parents, but to yeah. do that, we have to be fathers to them. We yeah. have to be mothers to them. Yeah. And so I... I find my, my vocation is really being uh, teaching fatherhood. Yeah. And yeah. that's what it means to be a pastor. I'll, I'll never be what I would call a master administrator. Mm -hmm. It's not my language. Yeah. It's not my skill set. I mean, I'll do what I can. Yeah. But I have to get good people around me to hold me up because if it's up to me, I, <clears throat> I'm going to fail. But I do feel good at the role of being pastor yeah and i especially during the pandemic i've learned 
uh, Father Joe, you have to pray and you have to trust in God. And that's that's a walk that I have to go deeper every day in. Sure. I had something happen about, it was March 28th. I was climbing one of the mountains with the kids. Mm -hmm. And one little girl, she had sandals on, she is seven. I always help the little ones. And I said, you got sandals, you can't have sandals on. And I said, you're staying with me. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm walking with her up this steep, it's a trail, and I'm reaching my foot up to get a grip. I don't know what she did. She f slipped and fell, oh. and she pulled me backwards. Oh. I'm, I'm, I, I'm really good at my balance, but as I'm lifting one foot to the next position, oh. I have that microsecond of vulnerability. Mm. And she fell at that exact time. Oh and she pulled me backwards off the trail. And as I'm falling, and it's a steep grade, I pulled her out of the way. But that, with that, I lost total control. Wow. And, um, and I fell, cut my head. I got nine stitches. Really? And stitches in my arm, but I rolled. I've never had this experience out of control roll down jagged rocks oh. and boulders. Oh. I'm 68, I'm not, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is not good. We don't want to, no, not falling down not jagged good. boulders, no, no. And um, people say, how far did you roll? I say, to the bottom <laughs> of, oh, the, boy. of the hill. It was 58 feet rolling down. Wow. On, it took about 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> all the way down. Now, there's no way that I could have not had something more serious. Yeah, yeah. I get, I hit the bottom and uh, I never got knocked down. Never got a headache. Really? The one little kid, he's 14, pulls off his t-shirt, wraps my head because it was bleeding profusely. And, um, Another little kid says, I'll run to the house. It was a kilometer away. I'll run to the house and I'll, get, I'll tell everybody. And uh, I told the other kid, I said, go up and get the little girl. She was, she was fine. And then there were two other teenagers and uh, we had them come down. They helped me walk because I was having difficulty walking. Sure. But you know what? Not a scratch on my kneecaps. Really? Not a, I had a big patch of skin off here this yeah no chip teeth again i yeah i fell and as i fell i must have i always fall this way like a cat yeah i fell this way and my hands protected my mouth and i could feel the impact of the head hitting stones and rocks yeah and uh, but nothing knocked me here yeah. all the hits were on the side top front and um no mark on my spine. Really? The, the doctor said, it's a little weird. He said, <laughs> yeah, there's I have, no good reason. Usually, yeah. usually when somebody falls that distance, they can have permanent back injury, tons of broken bones, not a single broken bone. What? And um, wow. so I spent three days in bed. I mean, it was messed up. But as Clint Eastwood would say, just flesh wound. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, so, um, so anyway, it, uh, I, when I got home, I said to the chiropractor, I said, I, I need an appointment. I want to just see how I am. I feel pretty good. Mm -hmm. but I want to see if my adjustment is in. Yeah. He said, I'll be ready for a, a long time. I went in 15 minutes. I was out. He said, you're in. <laughs> what? You explain that to me. Right. Every right. time we do a walk, we go to the grave of Father Jose and we pray. I feel that God was saying to me, you know, there's some, there's little changes I can make about how we do these walks. I have to make them even safer. Yeah. But, um, but I, I just felt the Lord say, do you think that if I can watch and over you, in that wild accident that you had mm -hmm. and protect you, that I can't protect the house. Mm. 
Wow, another yeah. another way of I've got so, this. Yeah. So I've I've really and that's only six weeks ago that that happened. Really? Yeah. So I it's on my mind a lot. Yeah. But not in a bad sense. Sure. It's one that where I just feel the Lord saying, "You need. I want you to trust. I want you to grow in trust." Yeah. And so rather than being a, a sad experience, mm -hmm. I told the doctor, I am absolutely overjoyed because I yeah. really feel that I experienced a grace of God in what happened there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so whatever time God wants me to do at Casa, I'm in. That's great. With both feet. That sounds, oh, uh, that, and it sounds like it's been beyond amazing. Like, I don't even know if that's the right, <laughs> the right word, the right. It is, understatement. it is, I've always wondered as a kid, what's it like to think in another language? What's it like to feel in another language? What's it like to communicate in mm -hmm. another language? And I, I couldn't even imagine it. And now I'm living. And now you're living it. And it's not just doing just little phrases, but I have to be able to teach, hear confessions. Yeah communicate at the feeling level yeah with with people and draw them out yeah and i think that's that's an adventure i never tire of yeah yeah, yeah. gosh that's amazing thank you thank you for sharing that all of that you're welcome and what you're doing because that's and, and all the people you're bringing along with you you know all the groups that are coming and pray for us because it, it's a big mission we will. and i will i keep... pray god protect us and yeah. guide us and, but I, I have to keep trusting yeah. that if we're doing his work, then he will get us through. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's great. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. I appreciate you okay. riding with me. So, You're yeah. welcome. Great.